But I think part of what Doug has offered is a kind of coup de cœur, with which I share. When he, when he would, was lamenting the moral impoverishment of what passes as conservative jurisprudence, I thought he had it right. The best thing we could do is send this thing back to the states, as though we, the, the Constitution disclosed nothing about what ought to be chosen. As, like as Bill Rank was saying in that famous speech, uh, if we have these liberties, it's not because there's any intrinsic importance to these liberties, but because they've been set down in the Constitution in the positive law. To which Harry Jaffa then responded, to say that those rights have no intrinsic liberty is to say that the individual person has no intrinsic importance. Because if he did, it would be the source of rights of intrinsic dignity. This is to back into a kind of conservative ver version of nihilism, the soft nihilism. Uh, I agree with that. I, I, when I Doug said those things, it was like it was a crude occur. Uh, but I but I found myself sort of recalling uh, if Groucho's line about Margaret Dumont. I was fighting for her honor, which is more than she ever did. <laughs> now, if the Republicans, if the Republicans are not fighting for the right principles, there are other ways of doing this. I happen to agree with with uh, Doug. And um, on the matter of Roe versus Wade, some people think it's going to, we're going to get back to the state. And some people are so um, uninformed that they think that the Supreme Court in overturning Roe uh, would simply outlaw abortions instead of simply returning it to the state. Which is why I've thought it made a certain kind of prudential sense, not exactly to overturn it, but to keep cutting it back, removing the substance behind the shell. Remember, Byron White, one of the dissenters in Roe versus Wade, said, I too could support Roe versus Wade if it had the same meaning of those other precedents from which Roe was supposedly derived. Uh, Loving versus Virginia, the right to marry, that basic right to marry did not mean that the state could not make many plausible restrictions on the freedom to marry. And if you say, I have a presumptive right to abortion, that's quite consistent with making many restrictions on the, on the choice of abortion. We could see that kind of right brought back down to what it was in the common law, right to have an abortion when it would be threatening the life of the mother, and people could be brought along. This is why it was a project in teaching, in teaching. That's what we thought we were doing with the Born Alive Infants Protection Act. We'd have the Congress weigh in to, to teach at the level, the fact that the draft I originally wrote for the first George Bush was to say, have the president say, the other side insists that abortion is not infanticide. They imply the way to protect the child at some point. Let us tell, let them tell us when it is, and we'll begin the conversation there. And if nothing else is forthcoming, how about birth? Can we protect the child who survives the abortion? Because we had one judge in Tennessee with a case of a child who survived the abortion for 21 days, died, the question was raised. Was there an obligation to preserve his life? The answer was no, that's not a child protected by the law. It's a fetus marked for termination. The right to an abortion is the right to an effective abortion. Could we just start with that? And we're raising questions. What's different about that child when it comes out and what it was? Ten? And we're telling you right away. We, we think if you give us this premise, we can unravel your whole position. But we'll do it step by step in the conversation. And if we don't persuade you, well, from that vast volume of 1.3 million abortions, we may have saved a handful of lives, and that is no trifling thing. Look, um, an analogy. Woody Allen once had a story of a man in the men's ready to wear. He couldn't sell the shirts. He asked God what to do. God said, I want you to sew a little alligator on that shirt. <laughs> and he said, a what? He said, sew the alligator. And sure enough, those shirts sold like gangbusters. Now, if somebody said to us, paint the wall with polka dots, I would guarantee you if you do that, the number of abortions will come down in the country. Well, I could start sewing on the alligators and painting the wall with polka dots. Now, 10 years from now, the abortions have not come down. People ask, what have you been doing? I've got to give, 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 you've filled all these rooms with polka dots. What have you been doing? In the interval, I could have been working step by step in a modest approach to try to save a handful of lives and get a conversation going. And if people came back and said, what have you been doing all these years? You haven't saved all that many lives. At least I could have given a coherent account 
of what I've been doing, the connection between the means and the ends. Um, in a similar way, um, uh, we may take the line that uh, we're going to save, we're going to save, we're going to save lives by um, uh, speculating on these means of um, of lifting the gross national product. We may or we may not succeed in saving the lives, but at the same time, we're working with the premise that there still is that right. That, that right has remained. Let's say in the, the, the vein of the Woody Allen analogy, we discovered that we bring people into a birth counseling clinic and by playing Cole Porter's You'll Be So Nice to Come Home To, 90% of the people talk themselves out of abortions. A manifestly good thing. But we've left undislodged the conviction absorbed in the souls of our people that they nevertheless have a right to destroy an innocent life for a real reason that need to rise above their own self-interest and convenience, I would argue to you that the souls of our people will have been disfigured, even while the number of abortions have gone down. So again, my problem, Doug, is we've told me, we have a candidate who will not accord even the slightest respect to the child who survives. The measure of that candidate is, he would not have us move to protect even the child who survives an abortion, born alive, less in protecting that child, we offer respect for that life, and set in place a measure that would call Roe versus Wade into question, I'd say, that's the measure of the man. That tells us enough. Why would we sign on to that? To a series of speculative reflections about what alterations of the gross national product could do. And by the way, there's nothing that the Democrats are willing to do in this respect that Republicans have not been willing to sow in our provision. As, as Bill McGurn of the Wall Street Journal points out, somebody has a, a, an abortion, and that's it for Planned Parenthood, but with birthright, they stay with you to help you over the transition to get the apartment and, and so on. So I would find myself saying, look, at the end of the day, we still have this question. We've had another example in Florida of a child who survived an abortion. They took his license away. One of my students said, no one ever bothered to point out that they're in violation of a federal law, the Border Life Infants Protection Act. We never provided the penalties for that act because we thought it would be a pure teaching bill. Not a single Democrat in Congress voted against the bill. Now we can come back and Barack Obama said, I vote for that federal bill. John Stuart Mill said, we stop using the language of like and dislike and begin using the language of right or wrong to the extent that we think someone may be rightly punished. Okay, all the Democrats, no Democrat in Congress oppose that measure to protect the child who survives the abortion. We just had another dramatic case. So then Doug would come back and say, all right, how serious did you people in the Democrats in Congress take this issue? If you think it's wrong, is it a time to provide a penalty? Tell us what the proper penalty is. Is it at least as serious as a moving violation in traffic? Tell us. I see great utility in at least putting the question to them. And then I guess I put the question, Doug, if we're going to do that, I think I was th that you would be with us on that move. That you would be with us in wanting to take that seriously and provide that penalty for the someone who would deliver a child alive and throw it in the wastebasket, rather than with Barack Obama, who seems steadfastly opposed to making that concession, lest he reveal something that will unsettle his whole position. So I found myself, I guess, in the line of the awkward position of Pinkerton in Madame Butterfly and saying, Vieni, Vieni, come back to me. Come back to me. <laughs> I never left. Uh, the uh, I think just as uh, 
President Lincoln's repeated efforts to compromise with the intrinsic evil of slavery. I think the efforts to cut back on Roe, to overturn it, ought to continue, uh, ought to uh, go forward. And, and I'll keep signing those briefs. I'll keep writing parts of them. Um, on the Born Alive, uh, you know, Lincoln did that you know, so many different ways. He kept, uh, he kept in, his, in his head the notion that the slaves are going to be sent back to Liberia. He kept that idea alive over and over again. He was willing you know, to uh, acknowledge the enforcement, as was said in several of the panels of the Fugitive Slave Act. He was willing to abide even a constitutional amendment that makes slavery a permanent feature of the Constitution, that would have that be repulsive repulsively un incapable of being changed except by yet another amendment. He let himself make the pure, unadulterated, natural law argument, it seems to me, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act got passed, when Dred Scott came down, and he recognized that all these little dodges that he was engaging in, all of these little temporary measures that he was using, these prudential measures to buy time, to undercut the, uh, the, the, the uh, morality, the claimed morality of, of, of slavery, had now been thwarted. Now suddenly, people could take their slaves to any part of the country after Dred Scott with impunity. And he was angry. And that anger brought him back into public life. It's the general historical assumption that he would not have been on Mount Rushmore or anything other than a rail splitter or a country lawyer had he not been energized by that proposition. But even after, when he made his 1860 campaign speeches, the House Divided speech, and used that ambiguous phrasing, as the historians point out, we shall not fail. And some historians say, oh, he meant the abolitionists shall not fail. And when he sent that signal, we know what happened. Maybe what was bound to happen inevitably. The union he so desperately wanted to preserve split apart even before he could take the oath of office, no matter where you put the word faithfully. No, John Roberts, you weren't here. <laughs> On the Born Alive Act, I said in the book, and I'll say here, if I was in the Illinois legislature with Barack Obama, I would have told him, vote for this law. But he, t he voted against the law yeah. for the very reason you described. Because he saw the principle. He saw what was at issue. He saw what was at issue. And, it was in, and, and in that sense, it was the equivalent of the states splitting from the Union for him. Now, the question is, what do you do with him on that? Do you, do you confront him with it? Yeah. Or do you do the Lincoln-esque thing and keep the conversation alive, acknowledging his great good in so many other respects, not as a replacement, not as a justification, not as an excuse, but as part of the proportionate analysis that one must engage in when one is looking for prudential ways. And after all, to seek the good and to avoid evil is both teleological and prudential at the same time. Proportionate is the dangerous word. It is. It's the word the bishops use, however, so I'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> Proportionate with grave seriousness, they properly conjoin it with. You know, the business, your Woody Allen, you have better Woody Allen jokes than I do, but, uh, and the business about, I tried to defend my honor. Yeah. 
<laughs> I think whenever you try and have a conversation with someone as Lincoln did, as I would submit, not in Lincoln's stature or in his company, but as I would suggest I am attempting to do with the current President of the United States, and as I did during more than once during the campaign, eye to eye, it's an attempt to find common ground. Finding common ground is not easy when first principles are at stake. You can say, I am right, I know what the correct answer is, and you can insist upon it, and the conversation will be at end. Or you can continue to have that conversation. I think his willingness the President's willingness to work at least on the economic side of the ledger to reduce the incidence of abortion is an invitation to have the conversation stay alive as much as Abraham Lincoln's promise of a constitutional amendment to guarantee slavery in the places where it existed. I think it is indeed a better conversation than, Lincoln, than Lincoln's own bargain. Lincoln's bargain to me seems anathema. Obama's not driving as hard a bargain, it seems to me. We'll see. I don't submit these things in substitution. But I do think we are called upon to form a community on more than a single issue, as great and as profound as this issue is. The Church herself, in the form of our bishop's teaching, reminded us that the Catholic faith is not organized around a single issue. The way the Church put it, was to say, we are not single issue voters, though you may use a single issue to disqualify a candidate. I assume the church knew what it was doing when it used the verb may and didn't say must. I assume the church was not abandoning her teaching about the intrinsic evil of abortion. I assumed the American Catholic Church was doing exactly what John Paul did in Evangelium Vitae, recognizing political reality, recognizing the context, which was Lincoln's great strong suit. Lincoln said in the House Divided speech, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we would then better judge what to do and how to do it. That's not an abandonment of principle. That's merely saying, know where you are, know what the opposition to the application of principle is, and use that wit that God has given you to find ways to advance the good. Thomas More did this. Thomas More, when he was admonished by his daughter to arrest Richard Rich because he was a bad man, said, how am I to enforce this standard of badness? <clears throat> God knows he's a bad man, was Margaret's response. Well, then let God arrest him. All Thomas knew 
was the paltry bit of knowledge that comes to men and women, even in great institutions like this, where we can never know the full mind of God, and yet we keep yearning for it in St. Augustine's reminder of how anxious our hearts are until they rest in Him. I'm just looking for that alternative path. Thanks. A quick interrogatory, as Lincoln would say for my friend. Um, Lincoln member told people, do not entertain any proposal for the extension of slavery. He was quite willing to negotiate over the modalities, how long it takes to, to rule it out, whether we can have to keep it in the Constitution as it is not. But the thing that was not negotiable, whether it was wrong in principle, see. Uh, but the problem is, are we not signing out to a candidate who, in fact, has insisted on the rival principle? The rival principle. That that life of that child has is no life that we are being obliged to respect. But I just want to point out, Doug, and just get your action on this. Those Republican presidents we've had, Reagan, the two Bushes, yes, they were not people who were able to really explain the pro-life position. George W. Bush never even endorsed our bill on the Border Life Act. It was a bill made for somebody to talk about, to get the conversation going. He would never even talk about it. As Robbie George used to say, the problem with the Bushes is that they were all action and no talk. <laughs> now we needed to talk. <laughs> but let me point out, and I've been business with you, Doug. Those artless Republican presidents still had you at a high level in the Justice Department. The president you've just helped to put in office has no one like you anywhere at every, le at every level. And instead what we find is the Department of Justice, the United Nations, Health and Human Services, everyone are the people there, are the people who are your mere opposites. It's not simply negotiating over the modalities, but putting in place people who represent a principle radically at odds with yours. Um, what, what would be your reaction to that? Is, this administration contains no Doug Comeck anywhere in its opinions. Well, it doesn't have Doug Comeck, that's true. But it, it does have Josh Dubois and Mark Linton and Mara Vanderslice and uh, John Kelly and uh, a large number of other young people that drove me around interminably in Pennsylvania in the fall so that I got to know this state better than, I, than most of you probably know. State. I, Erie, Scranton, Harrisburg. Um, nice state. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed until it got real cold. And then, <laughs> you know, last week, Hadley, yeah. uh, the, uh, the president announced his Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. He put in charge of that office Josh Dubois, who's an evangelical Protestant minister who uh, indeed, uh, is uh, strongly pro-life. Uh, Mark Linton, who uh, is uh, the person who was an out, who was the outreach person, uh, is strongly pro-life in the sense that Democrats can ever be strongly pro-life. Now, what does that mean? That means they're not upsetting the legal regime, but they're working through this economic and social mechanism and want to do that. So it's not totally forgotten. It's not invisible to them. And indeed, when the president announced the initiative, he said the purpose of supporting churches and religious bodies is so that the incidence of abortion can be reduced, so the number of unwanted pregnancies can go down. Now that's, you know, I, I would speak in a different vocabulary, I would speak in our vocabulary. Right. And when I spoke to him, I spoke in our vocabulary. Now, by the way, you should, I, I, you know, that, that wasn't, he, he, he told me in that conversation when uh, we first met, that anything I asked him I didn't have to keep private. There was no executive privilege, so I'll tell you the, the thrust of the conversation. I, I was outraged by what he said, I think, in this state about that punishment state. I said, right. I said, how in the world can you look upon an innocent unborn as a punishment? I said, have you not read Mother Teresa? 
Now, he's a clever guy. So he gave me a clever response. His response was, no, you misunderstood. I said, no, I don't think so. He said, no, I think you misunderstood. He said, there is a punishment. The punishment is the subtraction of the joy of welcoming a child. He said, when your wife informed you that she was pregnant with your first child, Knowing I had five, he said, I don't want to risk this answer on the last one. <laughs> he said, uh, how did you feel? I said, I was ecstatic. One of the happiest moments in my life. I couldn't wait to get on the phone and call everybody. In fact, I didn't wait to call everybody. I just went outside and started telling people. My... Uh, only married child is with child. I'm happy to tell you that. <laughs> and he looked me in the eye and said, that's the punishment. Someone who is poor and unmarried and not in a position to welcome that child has none of that joy. I want to address, he said, the absence of the conditions that prevent that joy from occurring. That is not an insignificant accomplishment if he can do it. I don't mind helping him do that. But the, the want of that joy should not be affecting the claim of that unborn child to live. I don't think anyone um, would ever accept the notion that people lose their claim to live because they become unwanted or unpopular. By that measure, we'd have lost Mr. George Steinbrenner. Um, <laughs> Many years ago. Um, do I get a chance to do an interrogatory? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and I'll but, but, okay, but what, let me say it. I, I think. I think. You have something—a think, Steinbrenner joke. Okay. You got another one. Uh, again, I think Benedict, Benedict has made this clear that those other issues cannot stand on the same plane as the direct, intentional killing of an innocent being. They are all issues, but we cannot put them on the same plane. And, and by the way, one of the problems with Bush, with what I take to be Obama's move, is that he likes to consider this a matter of religious faith, where the whole notion of what is a human person depends on your belief. But the Doug Kamek I know is the one who said, this does not depend on faith. This depends, as the Catholic position does depend, on the objective evidence of embryology woven with moral reasoning. That is different from what I think the premises are of Obama's putting this into something he calls religious outreach. Yes, and you've anticipated the question because that's okay. exactly where I went with him, and that is that uh -huh. this is not a matter of faith, I said. This is a matter okay. of objective scientific proof. All one has to do is know the nature of the human zygote, and you know that all of uh, life's ingredients in terms of DNA and the balance is there and if man does no interference the, the process of birth will complete uh, and uh, you know it cannot be objectively denied. Um, what did he say to that? He said well do you have any uh, Presbyterian friends? Do you have any Methodist friends? Do you have any Reformed Jewish friends? I said, I believe I do in all of those categories. He said, they deny your objective scientific fact. Some of them deny it as part of their faith teaching. And the critical ground on which we make that discrimination among them is to simply take their faith as it stands without asking the question whether, well, no, whether, whether the, how they address the evidence of embryology. No, I, I don't. They do, okay. And this sounds like it's, a, it's one of the dramatic failures of adult education, and you're talking to him. <laughs> Here's my question to you. And that is, notwithstanding what I believe to be the objective scientific reality, which is also a moral reality of the human person, these other faith traditions are saying to us there is a leap from the 
the scientific fact to the legal conclusion. And that all, the, all you're doing, they point back at me and to you, I would bet, venture, and is to beg that question, to beg that leap. So make the leap. Give me the, give me the line when I see him next assuming that is to be, that you would respond to him on that proposition. If someone told us that by his own belief, he doesn't think life begins until the age of five, you would not credit that simply because he's offers it to you under the, under the uh, auspices of belief. Uh, you would ask him to say, you know, to make a discrimination between those people who know that what's the basis of the judgment. Except, I don't share your beliefs, so what is the ground accessible to you as well as to me? by which I could understand the reasoned ground of your position. Back at Princeton about a year ago, Bill Galston was restuck, restating that line of the Talmud that um, the, the, the embryo up to 40 days is water. And Mike McCulloch said in challenge, all right, do you accept that as true? It's incoherent. You can't kill water. Are you telling me that we, you, you, you are asserting this in the face of the strong evidence of embryology? as though anything you simply invoke in the realm of belief is sufficient to overturn it. We'd say, no, not good enough. Not good enough. You know, I had an offer to... to so I, I think this, yeah. this offer of adult education that you and I are uh, about... Yeah, you're an exemplar of, that, yes. That, that we are about to undertake for the larger community needs to take place right at this juncture. And so that, in fact, the scientific coupled with moral understanding of the human person is indeed the one that is constantly made, not the federalism argument. Exactly. That was so exactly. There's, I think that's where you had it. Absolutely. So right, Doug, and that's why I, I was, I could see what was at work, work, work with, with you. That's where you have exactly right. I met your guy a couple of weeks ago. I must say, he has a kind of smile that could melt anybody. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, one of our mutual friends, uh, Mike Madigan, leaned into me in Washington in November and said, how would you like to join Republicans for Obama? I said, I think I missed that train and I passed up reformed Jews for Hitler and so I... <laughs> <laughs> we, are, uh, we are scheduled to go uh, for about another 14, 12 minutes, something like that. Um, and so I want to be sure to open the discussion up to the floor. Uh, to Look out. Here comes, here comes the dean. It's my co-author, so I get yeah, my co-author. Is that on? Is that on? Okay. Uh, um, I'm a little puzzled by the logic of the argument. A lot puzzled. Uh, Hadley began uh, reflecting on one group of your critics, Doug, uh, that had taken the position that you had assumed the moral question of abortion to other moral questions of less weight. Iraq war, uh, sub financial support for uh, alternative opportunities for abortion, what have you. And I think no, you no, 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 no. Wait one second, because right at that premise, you're, you're gonna go off, off track. No, no, I'm gonna credit you on that. You rebutted him by saying that wasn't my position in your initial round of remarks. Um, but now you're gonna decredit well, you, you came back at it at the end a little bit, which which puzzles me because he, he, he countered, he countered, he didn't rebut. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Um, but enough, but it, so your argument is a prudential one, the first one you make. It's a prudential argument that I think if we fund family planning services, if we do these other things, it will reduce the incident of abortion. Um, still on the table is Hadley's challenge to you. That leaves the reduction still with the moral wrong question unaddressed. And that, that's, that's a, 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 a warrants further discussion. But the second group of your critics... In the same way that I suppose you could have an extended discussion about Lincoln's attachment to preserving the Union as a mechanism... Yes, exactly, precisely. But the second group of your critics claimed that your um, notion that Obama was going to take these steps and therefore advance the cause of pro-life was naive because it, this was politicians' rhetoric to get you on board and he wasn't going to do that. Right. Um, and and we can we can question whether you did it last week. Well, we can Sorry. question whether ex ante that was true, but ex post it's clearly not true. His first action was not what you describe, but rather was to increase global funding for abortions. Right. 
which, which directly counteracts the prudential claim you made. And so I don't understand after that how we can continue to insist that this conversation will, is the best prospect for reducing abortion and reestablishing the moral proposition. Right. Well, he, you know, he's, uh, he's, uh, he did reverse Mexico City over my objection. I don't know why he keeps doing things over my objection, but he does. Uh, and uh, the one, as you know about Mexico City, Mexico City still leaves Helms in place, and Helms prohibits the use of any federal dollar for abortion counseling or for the performance of abortion by a foreign uh, non-governmental organization. So we have to be careful. A lot of public reporting didn't draw that distinction. Uh, what, what Mexico City did was withdraw federal funds from any entity that was using its own funding, non-federal funding for referrals for abortion as part of its family planning work. Uh, what's Obama's explanation for that? Well, it's the one he gave. He, didn't, uh, he was honest about this throughout the campaign. He basically said, in the third world, the way I see it is that when, we've, when we put Mexico City in place, we close, a lot of, we, we close sometimes the only clinics in villages that is, are supplying any kind of health care and the consequence of that is an enormous increase in sexually transmitted disease, most notably HIV AIDS, and an enormous increase in the number of pregnancies, and an enormous increase in uh, the number of abortions. And so from his perspective, again from his perspective, not mine, that he sees this as a health issue, and by virtue of that he's going to keep those clinics open uh, that is going to engage in contraceptive practices that are not consistent with the, with the Catholic Church. So there's no way in the world that I would be able to stand here and applaud that action. Um, and so it is, it's part of the mosaic of the vineyard that I've walked into. Uh, but it's, it seems to me that it's not completely at odds with, to have that health interest even though it's a health interest built upon theology that I don't accept, with his faith-based initiative that was explicitly directed at reducing abortions through that mechanism and that structure that he put in place last week, what, two weeks into his presidency. So now that's still way short of where I want him to be, uh, but it, it's certainly not forgetting about the promise. It, you know, if within the first month of his presidency he articulates the structure and appoints people to implement the promise, I think that's a, worthy of at least some credit. Uh, now, one needs to continue to oppose the Freedom of Choice Act, which Hadley brought up, which is one of the worst pieces of legislation ever drafted, both in terms of its meaning and its purpose. Uh, and I have every reason to believe that there's nobody in Congress that's serious about advancing it. Um, but, you know, I don't, I think my bishops are right to be belt and suspenders bishops. And the po little postcard campaign that we've got going, you know, in our parishes is great. Because it puts us on record against something that would be an abomination. But... I'd also like to see a postcard campaign that said, I'd like to sign up for President Obama's faith-based uh, and uh, a neighborhood partnership program to have federal funding from uh, the United States come to my parish for purposes of filling the treasuries of the, uh, of the local community so that when Carol finds those young women who come to her and when she finds them when they don't come to her, that uh, the resources will be greater for that type of work. Good. Oh, you're calling Professor Arcus, did you want to say anything? I'll hold it for a moment. I spoke with it. I think Bill has a question. I don't know if you can go all the way for this. Um, I thought John Eason was going to say something else. I, I'm uh, somewhat, I must tell you, disturbed by the exchange, and I love you both dearly, as you know, but, uh, but uh, something's missing, something's going off the rail in this conversation, and let me see if I can summarize it first and then pose a question. It's not clear to me from your exchange 
that there is anything urgent about the question of what the people believe about abortion. It is rather a question about the potentiality to persuade or influence a public official who doesn't, from the presentation, seem to occupy a strategic position with respect to the moral question that you're deliberating between you. So I would like both of you to respond to the following question, bearing that in mind, and remembering that Lincoln didn't simply become the candidate of an existing party that may have been regarded as problematic with respect to the principle of the day, but formed a new party, i.e., in Lincoln's time, there was room for political initiative by concerned citizens. And I count you as concerned citizens. So what I would like to know then is, given the weightiness of the issue which you have both conceded, why have you been fiddling away your time with whatever comes along as a potential candidate lining up as backers or bearers instead of going out there beating the bushes? There must be at least 150 people in this country suitable to perform the mission you want to see perform. Why isn't that the focus of your energies, as opposed to trying to rehabilitate the loss? Hey, may I respond to that? Where, where were you when I made the world? I mean, <laughs> where were you over the last 20 years as I've been arguing for this measure day in and day out, making the rounds of Congress, trying to talk to the president? Look, Bill, you, I love you, but you weren't attentive to what I was saying. I mentioned we had a Born Alive bill. The bill was to start a conversation, to find out that ordinary people can talk about these things, that most of the public was with us when we said we want to reject the notion that the right to an abortion is the right to an effective abortion or a dead child. And we were going to go step by step. And as we go step by step, ordinary people get the sense that they can talk about these things again. And that was the point. Was that not the point also of my notion that you talk people in, into the scheme that will just choose a bit less of it, but meanwhile will keep absorbed in the souls of our people the recognition that they have absorbed this right to kill as it suits their convenience. It's been all about that. It's all been about public teaching, Bill. Uh, as to the candidates, this quadrennial thing, we do have to make these decisions. And the, and the question is whether we're going to appoint to all levels of the government, the UN and the HHS, People drawn from Planned Parenthood, people are committed to make every UN conference a conference on housing and reproductive rights. Dry cleaning and reproductive <laughs> rights. Anything and reproductive rights to make the project universal so that it becomes fed back into the American law through international conventions, or whether we're going to have at all levels of the government people like Doug Kmet, who, who applied that perspective in everything he did when he was in office. So I don't, I don't see the disconnect, Bill, if I, may, if I have, the, have the temerity to defend myself. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you about that. Okay. I'm sure it would be sure good for my character to hear it. But... I hear what you're saying, and it, it would, it would, Bill, it would be a relatively easy thing for me to implement now since I'm no longer welcome in the Republican Party, and I never really had any friends in the Democratic Party to begin with. So uh, oh, I, 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 I might as well I might as well <laughs> form a new party. Uh, so uh, the the, uh, the fierce urgency of now maybe that would be an expression that I could borrow from uh, the president. I, no, yes, I'm not. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I guess, Bill, that was part of my call about, or my reflection about where my church has migrated. You know, my church has gone from a human life amendment, which was the non-negotiable position with Ronald Reagan when I was in the D Department of Justice, to accepting being the te and I'm not criticizing the teaching moment that had me arranged, because I think it's a continuation of the teaching moment from the partial birth right. exercise. Right, right. And both of them, I think, are effective. Uh, but um, it, it is a symbol of our times, how much we have drifted uh, from the commitment. Uh, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about the Catholic we now. Uh, right this moment, I feel more Catholic than I feel Democrat or Republican. 
Uh, my, John Paul told us that our faith transcended all partisanship, that it was not a political party. Uh, I feel more guided by that faith than anything else, and, and perhaps the most hurtful thing, and, and people don't like me to talk about this because they think I'm whining all the time, uh, the most hurtful thing of the, of the campaign was not all the ugly things said on the blog, but, but was the denial of communion in my local church for having endorsed Senator Obama. Because effectively, that my church was in the in, in the presence of that priest was saying, "You are separated from the body of Christ, the body that is here and the body that you are about to receive in terms of the real presence." That's a deep scar that I will never be able to fill. But it is nevertheless, even with the cardinal saying it was an indefensible act and forcing the priest to write me a letter of apology. Um, it wasn't about a letter of apology. It was about the, it was the profound misunderstanding of the faith. And I didn't refute or speak to your characterization of that for me, Hadley, because I don't think I mischaracterized the faith in any regard, and I do think the priest on that given moment made a horrendous mistake. Um, and uh, the only good part of the moment as I reflect in the book is that as I was in the communion, as my wife left in tears, and as I was standing there with my hand outstretched and the priest had his hand tightly over the ciborium, there was a, a voice from the back of the line that said, are you judging this man, Father? And I thought to myself, this is the last judgment. I'll have a few good friends who'll say, cut him a little slack, Lord, cut him a little slack. Not that afternoon. But I appreciate the suggestion, and I'm willing to sign up with the party. We just need a name and a lot of resources. We, uh, we have time, I'm told, for two more brief questions. Uh, first in the back in the corner. Is it going to be answered yes or no? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, just a question. Uh, earlier in your remarks, you made reference to the fact that you had voted for Bush the, the other two, well, two times he was a candidate. And I'm just curious if you could explain the distinction in your mind between Kerry and Obama. Um, that is, would you say that this is a distinction, like a, a change in your thinking, sort of an evolution of your thought on these issues, or would you say that it's a difference fundament, fundamental to the candidate himself? I think it is the latter, and it, and it is for me the uh, you know, Senator Kerry actively went to abortion rallies and uh, uh, really made that in ways that Senator Obama did not uh, a, a reason to vote for him. By contrast, Senator Obama called me to Chicago and said, let's talk. I want to hear your side. Give me as good as you can get. Maybe I should have had Hadley in my pocket because you know, then I would have been more effective. But the fact of the matter is, is that he wanted the best argument against his position and does have a disposition that says, on almost every issue, um, I want to listen to the other side. And I didn't perceive that in Senator Kerry. The other fact of it is, is that uh, this will make me an apostate with my Republican friends, but I think we, and, and this is not this is not a weighing of these other issues against abortion, but on the other issues, I thought Senator Obama was far closer to what I perceived to be the Catholic social justice mission than what I perceived my party to have become. Because concern about the immigrant, concern about the environment, concern about a family wage, concern about the things that my church consistently has talked about in the last 25 years was better articulated by him than anything Senator Kerry articulated. For me. Last question in... Uh, Hello? Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I wanted to address... Oh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, right. yes, Your Excellency, you yes. <laughs> He referred several times to Lincoln's endorsement of a constitutional amendment guaranteeing slavery in the states before 
1860 and before. Uh, you seem to think that that was a concession that he made. Uh, in point of fact, it was settled constitutional doctrine before the Civil before the 13th Amendment that the states had exclusive jurisdiction over their domestic institutions. That was agreed to as much by the anti-slavery free soil movement as it was by the pro-slavery group. Uh, Lincoln had frequently mentioned that in, in his speeches before he became a presidential candidate. And it was in the Republican platform of 1860. And when, and when he repeated that in his inaugural address, he was repeating it with a plank in the Republican platform. Uh, so it was not a question which was controversial in any way, and he certainly wouldn't have endorsed any proposal which would have in any way divided the free soil movement. But the free soil movement was 100% agreed that uh, the states had the exclusive control of their domestic institutions. What made it a problem in 1860 was the fact that Dred Scott provided the premises, at least, for denying that the states had, that the free states had the right to exclude slavery. So he was really not taking a, a, uh, a, 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 a in any way weakening his anti-slavery position. In general, Lincoln in 1858 and 1860 did not endorse anything like voting rights for Negroes or anything like that, which would have divided his supporters. He had to keep as much support as he could for preventing the extension of slavery. I also want to just make a brief comment. You, quote, you, you spoke at some length about the Catholic pastoral law tradition. Uh, when uh, Mindy Boggs was appointed uh, ambassador to the Vatican by Ronald Reagan, and, and when Pope John Paul greeted her, he made a speech in which he endorsed flat out the natural rights doctrine of the Declaration of Independence and saying that this was the basis of moral reasoning. And the natural rights doctrine of the Declaration is focused on the proposition that all men are created equal. And it's regarded as, and it is a self-evident fact, that there is no difference between one human being and another human being that makes one by nature the ruler of the other, the way any human being is the ruler of a dog or a horse or a hog or any member of the inferior species. And it does vary. The, the complications of Catholic pastoral law doctrine really don't, they, they're it's consistent with it, but the, it's much more evident that all men are created equal in the sense intended by the Declaration and articulated by Lincoln. I have the uh... You know, I defer to the master on the history of this and the clarity of your words, Dr. Jaffa, are wonderfully instructive in writing as, as they are orally. And so uh, the, the only thing I would say with regard to the first point is there's no doubt about the constitutional structure as you related and, and what was left to the states. If we're talking about in philosophical terms that the Declaration overrides even the positive law of the Constitution, ultimately in terms of slavery that would be the only footnote i would i would drop to that uh, to that sentence uh, and as i understand it even after the emancipation proclamation abraham lincoln gave the southern states one last chance uh, i think i read in in your book that he sent represent that he he basically said if you will send he said to the south if you will send representatives to congress within a hundred days then the slaves in your states will not be freed by my presidential decree. Uh, so in terms of Lincoln's exhausting every opportunity to give the South a chance to remain part of the Union, it seems to me he, continues to do, he continued to do that even after the Emancipation Proclamation, even though it meant uh, preserving the institution of slavery in slave states, which I admit that was the Constitution's arrangement. By the way, when Harry Joffrey will always be my mentor. When Harry intervenes, I, 
he makes me think of that scene in Boswell's Life of Johnson where Dr. Johnson, working in the Royal Library, was come upon by George III, who inquired as to how his work was going. And when he got back, he told, Johnson told Boswell, I find it does a man good every so often to be talked with to by a sovereign. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when Harry speaks, I find it, it just good for the soul to be talked with by a sovereign. Let me just take a minute. You have to go catch your plan. I have to catch your plan. What the cookie, though, that what Margaret's saying went off lecture, she lectured to the Women's Auxiliary of the KKK because that's where the constituency was. And I wonder if the KKK had the only outlet for birth control in a certain area, would we have the decorous enough and subtle enough to choose not to go there to endorse the rest of their, the rest of their repertoire? I guess I'll, I'll, you mentioned Woody Allen, I think we could end with the Woody Allen line and say, with all of this, there's no question that there is a moral world out there. The only question is, how far is it from Midtown and how late does it stay open? <laughs> <laughs> celebration of the Lincoln Bicentennial. I do want to thank again uh, the Inter Interpreted Studies Institute for its sponsorship. Special thanks, of course, to the Matthew Ryan Center here at Villanova, its remarkable director, Colleen Sheehan, uh, and her staff. Uh, there is, I've been told to make an announcement, there is a reception, a floor up in this building in the President's Lounge uh, following this. But most of all, I want to thank two of America's leading constitutional theorists and public intellectuals for this remarkable engagement. Doug Kubik, who's on his way back to California, and Happy Arthur.